there's something I've always wanted to do, right? Hmm. Tough, uncompromising, no holds barred, no <laughs> beg your pardons. It's time for those intellectual sparring partners, Tim and Brady. <laughs> nice. That's a that's a reference to the intro to Graham and the Colonel, which was a comedy sketch on the Late Show, a big part of our formative years. Oh, was <laughs> a lazily named show in retrospect because at the time it was like the Late Show. Wow, that's cool, and it's late. But of course, mm. every at any time around the world, every day since has been two or three programs called the Late Show. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, this is an ABC one. I think there's still a tribute website called Champagne Comedy if people want to look it up. And your Reddit username, Duffelcoat Supreme, is a reference is a, a joke from Graham and the Colonel too. That was their racehorse. That's right. They're, 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 they're very poor performing racehorse. They were like they were like these two uh, sporting pundits that did like mm. a little comedy routine at the end of every episode of the Late Show. And one of the things they would talk about was the performance of their racehorse, Duffelcoat Supreme. Duffelcoat Supreme. Who mm. suffered with gout, which was yes. very mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a wonderful show. That was probably one of the very first things we bonded on, really. I think uh, yeah. we discovered that and fell in yeah. love with it and became quite obsessive there. We Great do show. well to not make too many late show references on this podcast. Mm. They sprinkle my like life, like in other places. I use the references in parenting and conversations at work just for my own amusement. Like people have no yeah. idea what they are, but... You know, just they just appear because they are so yeah. in, ingrained. Great TV show from the 1990s. Tough, uncompromising, no holds barred, no beg your pardons. It's time for those intellectual sparring partners, the Graham and the Colonel. Tim, I've got an idea for a podcast, which is, you know, our stock and trade here on the Unmade Podcast. It's nice. based on something that just happened to me last week. So I thought I'd tell you a bit about that and then and then tell you about the podcast idea after I regale you with the latest news. Right, okay. So I am ashamed to say I was caught by the constabulary exceeding the speed limit on one of the UK motorways. No. Mm. Oh, this is disappointing. I got done by a camera. I I think I had gone from the normal speed limit into like a a lower speed limit zone from a 70 mile zone to a 50 mile zone and i did not mm -hmm. uh slow my car sufficiently are you are you pleading ignorance like you oh officer i i didn't know or is it i'm not complete i'm not that aware i'm not saying i didn't do it uh and mm. and like um and i'm also don't want to make light of it i i do think it's important to obey speed limits and i'm actually quite a cautious driver I would say it's, it's a bit of a it's I actually am sometimes even mocked in our household for my slow and cautious driving. Really? So mm. to so to have been done speeding is a uh, there's a little bit of irony there. But anyway, I hold my hands up mea culpa. Now, when this happens in the UK, you uh, are fined and you will receive penalty points on your driver's license, which is a bad mm -hmm. thing. You receive too many penalty points, you will lose your license. But mm -hmm. also, just getting any penalty points on your license can make your insurance premiums go up, which is a very bad thing at the moment because car insurance premiums are insane in the UK. So one does not want this to happen. But there is an out. If you haven't been caught speeding in the last few years, which I had not, right. you can do mm -hmm. a speed awareness course oh, right. where you go along with other naughty people mm -hmm. who have been caught speeding and you are trained for several hours about why it's bad to speed. Do you have these in Australia? Is this an option in Australia as well if you're done speeding? Can you do the speed awareness course and then you don't get the fine and don't get the points? Well, I mean, I wouldn't know. No. I've been driving safely and cautiously on the roads for so long. Yeah. I wouldn't have it. <laughs> that, that's, that's a bit of a porky pie, actually. I, yeah. up until recently, have been a shocker on this front. But I know, have never heard about a driver awareness training kind okay. of thing. I mean, I'm aware of it from television programs and right. in the zeitgeist, you see people being sent to the things like this. Yeah. But I'm, I'm not aware of it myself. Okay. 
operating in Australia, or I would have taken advantage of it to get rid of my points. <laughs> so in Australia, if you get done, you get done. There's no out. You can't like... That's right. I think it's a bit different in every state, but certainly, mm. yeah, if you get 12 um, demerit points, they're called, yep. you're in big trouble. In fact, you actually get offered the choice of, okay, you can lose your license for three months, or you can just get one more chance. But if you get even one more point or two more points or something, mm. then you lose it for a year. Ooh. So... Okay. You're playing Russian roulette. So I have been on that line. Really? You've got to 12 demerit points. I have. I have about 15 years ago. And, oh. and I took it and I was so petrified and I drove so slowly and carefully. Yeah. And then one day I was, I was turning onto South Terrace and I didn't realise that un unlike the other terraces, which are 60, this one's 50. Mm. And I got pulled over and I was like, oh, my life has ended. Oh, I've tried so hard. Yeah. And the officer gave it to me and everything. And then I went home and I phoned up to find out, you know, how's this going to work now? And she she said, oh, no, you've got no points. And I'd actually been driving paranoid for so long. All my points had, you know, over time, Expired. they sort of, they disappear. Yeah. They expire. And I was in the clear. I was actually driving around paranoid for no reason. Oh, so I, there you I go. immediately started speeding again. <laughs> <laughs> that is bad. We do not encourage speeding. No. Yeah. No, that was a joke. Yes, that was that was humour. Meanwhile, you but you were you were actually arrested and sent off to one of these. I was sort of. <laughs> I wasn't arrested. <laughs> I was taken in shackles. <laughs> we were all chained together. You know, you're lucky you're not put on a boat and sent to Australia. Yeah. The, down um, to the colonies. <laughs> so I've this has happened to me before many years ago. I'd done one of these courses before. Uh, and it was like, you know, in a in a conference room in a hotel. It felt kind of corporate uh, anyway. Right. So this time I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go off to one of these things again. So it wipes out a whole day. But in this modern age, you can now do them. Ironically, you can do them via Zoom, which I which I made a few jokes about, uh, doing a speed awareness oh, course right. on yes, Zoom. Oh, right. Yes, very good. Um, <laughs> on Zoom, Zoom. Yeah. Mm. So uh, it's about, it was about three hours and I had to log on onto a Zoom conference call with about about a dozen other people from various parts of the UK. We were all there in the in the virtual naughty room with a sort of a contractor type guy who's employed to run these courses and you know, you do all sorts of interactive activities. Do you know what the speed limits are on various kinds of roads around the UK? It's a bit more complicated mm. than Australia, I think. Uh, and then you know, you've also sh shown videos and told why speeding is bad and how mm. how x miles per hour can make this much of a difference in your braking distances and the injuries and you can imagine all the different things you go through and what are you going to do to make yourself a better driver and speed less often this three hour epic course i sat through well, what do you mean like it was like you're all in there mm. were these three questions just being thrown out it sounds quite con confrontational like you brady what are you going to do now what like, was it I wouldn't say it was confrontational. He was like a nice guy. And it was like, right. you know, it was it was put in a proactive way. What are some things we could do, you know? How can we All make right. sure we don't do it again? It was more lovey-dovey than don't you do it again and tell me what you're going to do. So it wasn't like a coach in front of a team at halftime and they've been playing badly and he's just starting to point people out. You, no. You, you, Johnson, you're going too fast. I no, would say it was it wasn't more. A, it wasn't a big guilt trip, was it? It was like... There was, no, no, there was... Was, there was the right balance of guilt trip and being proactive, I and mean, we would. You, and it was quite interactive. You could call out answers to things, or so, but also you would uh, write things down so you so everyone had to interact. So he would say, "What do you think the speed limit on this road is?" And you had to write it on a piece of paper and hold it up to your camera, uh, oh, right. and things like that. But it wasn't like shaming you when you got it wrong. He was, you know, you can imagine right. it was all yeah. pretty, pretty positive. Yeah. It was, a, it was an interesting experience. The guy doing it I found really interesting too. Do you remember? He, he, here's us going back to our childhood and in-jokes from our childhood. Do you, you will remember this because we've joked about it for 20 years since. Do you remember when a policeman came to our school for the school assembly and did a talk? Because oh, yeah, this yeah. is around the time we're first getting our driver's licenses, some of us at school. So a policeman comes to the school and gave us all a big talk about driving and safety and speed yeah. awareness and that sort of stuff. So this quite stern policeman whose job it was to go around to schools and talk to kids came. And we, th th do you remember what our joke about him was? What we called him? Yeah, make no bones. Make no bones. Because <laughs> he always said, make no bones. Make no bones. One of you will die. <laughs> That's right. Make no bones. 
three of you will be dead by the time you're 20. <laughs> I think we've even mentioned this before. I feel like I've laughed about him recently. Oh, really? He's, yeah. Um, we call, legend call, in our mind. I don't remember yeah. his name. We just call him Make No Bones. Make, Make No Bones. bones yeah. This is Make serious. No <laughs> so, um, yeah. So he, I would say he took a more of a stick approach than a carrot. He was more, you know, yes. trying to... And that's what I like. I like a bit of scare tactics. Which was, which was funny because we hadn't actually done any driving yet. Like, that was the time to do the carrot. Like, hey, drive safely and have yeah. fun. But he was coming in with a stick and we hadn't done it. We hadn't even got behind the wheel yet. I, I seem to recall maybe we were shown pictures of crashed vehicles. Like, it was a bit that kind mm. of... Yeah, mm. it was a bit... Whereas, and I, that's what I was hoping was going to happen. Like the first time I did one of these courses, I'd been told they show you pictures of crashes and things like that. So I was like, oh, that's, that sounds quite interesting, quite fun. But they don't really do yeah. that anymore. It's all a bit, you know, they probably don't want to traumatize people. And they're, they're a bit more cautious yeah. about such things now. So uh, it was quite, it was a little bit, you know, soft touch for my liking. Mr. Air Crash Investigation, who likes a bit of, you know. <laughs> bit of action was there a test at the end there was no there was no test you just had, but what you did oh. have to do was leave your camera on at all times because i think they wanted to make sure you didn't like just like go to sleep or go off and watch tv so he could mon so we yeah. all had our cameras on so we could be monitored that we were paying attention and there was you were always having to do things like write things on pieces of paper to make sure we were engaged so there was in, the, in that respect you could you had to you had to be present and you had to you had to interact and you couldn't be driving like, just have it on your phone, on the dashboard, and just be driving along on Zoom. Dri <laughs> that wouldn't let you go from driving at 90 down the motorway. I love it. <laughs> he was... But the instructor, I think it takes... Don't get me wrong. Total respect to the instructor, right? This is a, mm -hmm. a nice man who's mm -hmm. earning a living making the roads safer. He was kind... He has to deal with all sorts of personality types. He had to deal with my occasional jokes, which were terrible. Mm. Joker in like No, I, I, t I, pr I tried not to, but at one point I started moving into comedy mode and then I made a joke which I think kind of offended him and then I kind of pulled back a bit and then I was in kind of oh. sucking up mode for the rest of the course, trying to be the best student to make up for my offensive joke. Right. Doing lots of nodding, were you? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Zoom sucking up involves lots of nodding and serious mm, and being like, yeah, being the mm, best. You lots of mm, <laughs> yes. Mm. I think Good I think point. he made. So, I think someone made a. I think he made some comment about passengers helping other drivers, and like I, I made some joke. Well, ha, you're obviously not married, as if you know, joking that you know my wife badges <laughs> me when I'm. But I think maybe he wasn't married or recently divorced or something because he seemed really upset by my "you're obviously not married" sort of joke. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, no, I really shouldn't have said that. So, oh, that's great. So, so I was in total crawling <laughs> mode after that. Uh, it, was a, it was very oh, poor that's... judgment on my behalf. Anyway, uh, but also the type of person who does that course, there is a kind of uh, David Brent, I'm a chilled out entertainer, comedian type element to them. Like he, they, they have these like these jokes and these way of talking and this routine that is kind of yeah, really, yeah, yeah. It's a bit cringy, like uh, all these jokes, you know, he's done a thousand times and and they're very safe jokes and they're mm. like, mm. yeah, it was really like. I was hearing someone give a speech once, right, in, in actually, it sounds braggy, but it wasn't, at Princeton in mm. the USA at a conference and a guy was giving a tribute to someone and he was saying, this person always knew how to call a spade a spade or a shovel. And it was, and that always annoys me. Like it's the safest, you know, you know, if you're sort of speaking affectionately about someone saying, oh, they know how to speak, you know, to call yeah. a spade a spade, but then you can add an extra little comment, which is, or a shovel, like, whoa, they really can. But he made it in such a polite way. It's always annoyed me as being, that's the safest it, that's like adding a cliche on top of a cliche to make it even worse. I don't know why it annoys me so much. Isn't it contradicting yourself? Because isn't someone calling a spade a shovel the opposite of someone who calls a spade a spade? Someone who calls a spade a spade is direct and, and doesn't yes. like, you know. Someone who calls a spade a shovel, you're saying, well, actually, sometimes they were a bit contrary. Sometimes they, would, they wouldn't be direct with you and they would be a little bit indirect. And ch So I think that's like it, a it's funny enough. I know, I know. It sounds like calling a spade a spade is like a straight talker and calling them a shovel is even more straight talking. But, of course, you're not. You're telling no, no, you're no, no. something else. Oh, isn't that the joke they're making? Isn't, isn't the intent of that joke to say 
they were a direct person, but sometimes they weren't. Ha <laughs> ha! Like we've all had that no. moment. He wasn't. Or? I think he's saying. I think he's saying he called. It's it's like an exclamation mark. He's calling a spade a spade. He always tells the truth. He's a straight shooter. And especially so, he could do it with, you know, a really frank way. He could even swear when he did it or something like that. Uh, okay. it's, it's like underscoring how much he could call a spade a spade by calling it a shovel. That's what I think. Anyway, it, it annoyed me so much because it's just, I don't know, it, I guess because you can see it coming. Mm. And, and then he said it. And so it just seemed like the antithesis of whomever the person he was talking about, you know, did. Yeah. The ultimate, mm. you can see the joke coming at formal events like that, and you will have had a lot of experience with this, Tim, is the moment the mm. minister asks at a wedding if anyone has any objections and the and the bride and groom look back at the audience and everyone laughs and there's that moment like, <laughs> is that moment not the same at every single wedding? <laughs> it's such a cliche. <laughs> I don't do that in... It's not in our liturgy, but I might really? start including it. That sounds like a oh, bit of yeah. fun. Yeah. I've seen it. I've been at weddings and I've seen it, but I've never heard anyone respond. Have no, you ever heard? But everyone respond? always laughs, like, "Oh, who's gonna, who's gonna?" Oh. Like, it's this, like, it's this, <laughs> it's this funny moment that has been funny so many times. Surely it's not funny anymore. Like, <laughs> surely it's not funny. No, but it always no, is. Indeed. Everyone always laughs and thinks it's an amusing moment. What would be really funny is if someone really did object. Like, oh. just no, I'm sorry, I object. That would be gold. Oh, It'd be so amazing. Gosh, I've never been oh. at a wedding where that happened. Well, they really object. Like, I just don't think they're a good match and uh, I don't think they've thought it through. And I don't, Like, they had really sensible reasons to the point where they kind of won over the crowd. Wouldn't that be awesome? Everyone's like, yeah, actually, we're not sure this is a good – we've had some reservations too. And the bride and groom look at each other and go, have we really thought this through? That would be awesome. I went to a stag party of a guy who was due to get married a couple of weeks later and then he turned up mm-hmm. on his wedding day and the bride didn't turn up. And she hadn't even organised the wedding. Like, they had, they'd each had responsibilities organising the wedding. He'd done his bits. She hadn't even done her bits without telling him and had no intention of getting married and then didn't turn up on the day. And, like, all family oh, turned up and everything. No And that way. was the day he found out. Oh, that's cruel. Mm. It's like she's changed her mind a while ago and then just decided to... I don't know. Just bluff think, it or something. Oh, I don't know. She's had gosh. to have not confronted the problem. We've just made every engaged guy listening yeah. <laughs> very <Yeah>. nervous. <laughs> You never can tell. So anyway, I did my speed awareness course. I haven't got any points. Yes. Not paying a well fine. Done. I would have yes. I would almost have rather paid the fine because like three hours of your life is like it's a really boring three hours, if I'm honest. But I really didn't want those points on my license, so so I did the course. And I have been driving carefully since, you know, I've been following my Good. my plans. Funnily funnily enough, I heard something this week in relation to driving safely that mm had a profound effect it had the effect i think your course was supposed to have on you Mm. i was i've not been sleeping particularly well last couple of nights and so funnily enough i put on a late at night a documentary about sleep Mm. and it's called like the sleep revolution however we all need more sleep and and it's about this sleep center at university here in adelaide that's doing all this research so i thought oh this will be interesting because sleep's a really interesting kind of topic it's all mysterious and Anyway, one just one part of it was a conversation talking about the dangers of, you know, not enough sleep. And one of them was on the road with a person who does like car crash investigations. And as we're, as he's, 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 and the interview's happening while they're driving along. And so he's asking these questions. And he says that sleep, like tiredness, contributes more to accidents than like drugs and alcohol and yeah, everything else. fatigue. And fatigue, indeed. Mm, mm. And um, it's like, oh, wow, that's actually quite interesting. And then he was talking about... You know, when you start to feel like you're too tired, you're already too tired. So, mm. if, you, if if am I too am I am I awake enough to sleep to to drive? If that's entered your mind, you've pro- you've probably already had a couple of very tiny micro sleeps, and it's mm. so so dangerous. Now, here's the point that got me. It's a, it's bleeding obvious, but I've never thought of it before. He says that he says the reason why we're never a good judge of our our, our fatigue is because we're never conscious when we of when we fall asleep. Mm. Falling as we're only conscious of waking up. Falling asleep is something that that it's like. And I was thinking it's like a trap door. It just suddenly suddenly it happens. Mm. You lay down. You know the moment's getting comfortable, and then it's morning, or mm. then it's the middle of the night. You, mm. We can't consciously observe ourselves going to sleep, so it's always happening unconsciously. 
And just that very idea made me realise you really can't control that moment at all. It really is like a trapdoor that just opens up at a certain time. Mm. And that got my attention in relation to driving Mm. very acutely. I suddenly thought, my goodness me, and I was thinking about it driving here tonight going, gosh, this is... this." This, I could just fall. I mean, I know we don't just walk around and just suddenly no. fall asleep. <laughs> You'd never do anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm not climbing that ladder. I could fall asleep. <laughs> I could fall if I fell asleep. Yeah. I mean, driving tight is incredibly dangerous. But, you know, we've all we've all been a bit tired driving somewhere and thought, well, I'm not going to pull over. I'm only 10 minutes from home. And you start doing things like mm. slapping your face and putting the window down to make the car colder and putting the music up loud and stuff. But So I think you can do things to mitigate it happening. Uh, but you're right. Once you got to That's that right. point where you're doing that, you really probably should be stopping. <laughs> I've I've stopped and had a sleep in a in a car park before when I've been really tired. Was this on like a long trip or something? Yeah, it was. It was a longer trip. Um, mm. Let me tell you a cool story about my dad doing that though. My dad mm. um, for a while was living in New South Wales over on the east coast of Australia, and mm. he was dating I think my mum who was still in Adelaide. So my dad used to drive between Sydney and Adelaide a lot, which is a very long drive, you know, a day's mm, drive. Like a day and a half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So on one of these trips, he was he decided he was too tired to be driving. So he pulled over in like a lay-by on the side of the road on one of these deserted Australian highways and pitched a tent in the lay-by and went to sleep. And What's a lay-by? Like a, a place where uh, where vehicles pull in, like, you know, usually a gravelly type sort of car oh, yeah, parky right. okay. area. Sorry, that's a British yeah. term, isn't it? I don't know. I can't remember what we mm. called them in Australia. These little parts where know, you can Just pull like off. a toilet pullover sort of place. Yeah, 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 place where you pull it. So he pitched a tent and went to sleep. Um, so in the middle of the night, he suddenly needed the toilet. So he got up and walked out into the scrub, into sort of the bushland nearby and was doing a wee. And as he was standing there doing a wee, he was looking back at his tent in the lay-by, just, you know, looking mm. at his tent, doing a wee. And suddenly this huge lorry, this huge semi-trailer truck, pulled in off the highway into the lay-by and ran over the tent that he'd been <gasps> sleeping in a minute before. And if he hadn't gotten up to take a wee, he would have been run over by the truck. Oh, oh my goodness me. Yeah. Crikey. Yeah. That's incredible. Do you remember, was there an explanation from the lorry drivers? Like, oh, sorry, I didn't see that tent there. Oh, I think it was more dad was, work. I think dad was stupid to pitch a tent in a lay-by where, where any vehicle could right. pull into myself. I think he, yes. I think, yes. I think it was probably more dad in the wrong than the truck driver. Uh, but yeah, the truck driver didn't see it, you know, just pulled in probably too fast. Obviously he wasn't looking. You should, he, the truck driver yeah. should have been looking at where he was driving at that speed because mm-hmm. he was pulling off the road and parking. But yeah, Golly didn't, didn't see the tent, just ran, o- ran over the tent and crumpled it with Dad's sleeping bag and all the gear in it. And uh, But Dad was not in the tent. He was having a wee. And I sit here because of that wee. Indeed. You'd think about that every single wee afterwards, wouldn't you? Gosh. <laughs> I don't think he does. <laughs> uh, anyway. That's incredible. Yeah, incredible. Wow. So, my idea for a podcast. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> What time is it? <laughs> My idea for a podcast is called Awareness Course. And each episode, you get mm. a bunch of guests who have done something wrong, who have some sort of weakness or deficiency, and you get them onto the podcast as a guest with an expert, and you give them an awareness course as to why they have to be better at this thing how they have to improve themselves, why it's a problem, ways to improve it. And they can also interact and say why it's a problem for them. Why is this a weakness? So you could have a, um, you could have a tidying the house awareness course where a bunch of Mm -hmm. messy people who don't keep their house tidy are called in and told why you have to be better at tidying the house. Tidying awareness course. Things you're, things you're bad at. Problem, they could be serious bad things like speeding. They could be trivial fun things like packing the dishwasher. Stacking the dishwasher mm-hmm. more efficiently in that. And you just have awareness courses each episode of the podcast where people are trained and talked to about the things they're not good at. And the thing that gives the podcast a bit of a, a bit of something different is that you have these guests who are like the naughty people, like me on the speeding course. You have a bunch mm-hmm. of them mm-hmm. uh, who are like the on the naughty step, being having their ways corrected. 
Yeah, you don't just have like an expert who's the telling off, you know, person, but you mm. actually have someone. It's a bit of a confessional as well. Well, yes. here's why I do it wrong. Here's, yeah. Mm. What awareness course do you need to go on, Tim? Oh, geez, that's a hard question to answer. Healthy eating awareness so, course? Proficient in so many areas. Yeah, no, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm eating a healthy amount of KFC. <laughs> uh, that, would be, that would be a good one. Like that, I, would, I could benefit from that one. Healthy eating, yeah. No, yeah. it could be. It. Um, what's what's another one? Do you know what I? I th- there are there are two different types of people in the world, and there are those people whose desktop is clean, and I mean their computer desktop. And yeah. there are other people that have Word documents and PDFs and JPEGs and all that kind of stuff just piled everywhere, distributed everywhere. Um, and I, you're that person. <laughs> I'm that person. I, I don't really use my desktop as a thing I look at, though. My desktop is like like a work, like a... a yeah, where you store things, obviously. <laughs> it's almost like a clipboard. It's like my, it's like a, it's like where everything gets dumped. And then maybe once a year, I'll do a big purge. But my desktop serves that purpose as a, as the, I need, I sc- I'm going to take the screenshot right now and grab it and then trip it up and turn it into a picture and send it to Tim. And I do that on the desktop and then I just leave everything behind. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason that's on my mind is the other day I did one of those big stock take moments where you just sit on the couch with your laptop and just mm. drag, drag, drag to the trash and clean it all up and it feels so liberating. Yeah. I'm the worst kind because I think I'm a super organized person and neat, but my desktop always has heaps of crap on it, but yeah. I really don't like it and I'm judging myself for it all the time. <laughs> but, self-loathing. Well, and so self-loathing. One yeah. of the tricks I've found, and this could be on the podcast, was when you take things like a screenshot, you design it so the screenshot doesn't go to the desktop, it goes to your downloads folder. Yeah. And that just ha- helps things it's it's that's a bit like sweeping crap behind the door, you yeah. know, or under the bed. Yeah, <laughs> my downloads folder also is a bit of a wasteland, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, nice, no. Nice. So yeah, idea. you're right. That could be one of the awareness courses. Uh, you know, file management awareness course for people who are bad at that. Yeah, but I like the idea of each each week. It's sort of like a self help, but it's and I mean, and there are a million self help uh, and podcasts about you know being more efficient and things like that but my gimmick Mm. would be that it's done in this more uh people have been brought in the offenders have been brought in like this disparate group of random offenders because that's what it was like for me there was some there was some old man from london and some single mother from wales and we were Mm. all like all these Mm. weird people who'd all the one thing we had in common is we'd all been caught speeding and this was a convenient Mm. time of day for us to do the course and we were all brought together and like you, you you do learn fragments about the other people from their answers and things they say and you kind of want to get to know them a bit more but you don't in the end and you're then as soon as the guy says okay you've passed everyone just leaves straight away but um but like i like the pod i think that would give the podcast a bit of a gimmick a bit of an i you know something a bit different is that you've got the, the disparate group of offenders talking about why they're offenders and their stories mm. about their wrongdoings mm. to add to the to the lesson this is a bit like Gilligan's Island, a snapshot of all these people thrown together in yeah. your situation. Or lost. <laughs> yeah. Or lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. There we go. Awareness course, the Awareness Course podcast, something like that. Parish notices. One of my this is one of my favourite parts of the podcast. Do you know what I have to next time you're in Adelaide, I'm gonna get you to do our church notices. Could I do the morning. parish notices at your church? Yeah. That'd be so awesome. Oh, my goodness. I would love that. I would love that. Oh. They're on a big PowerPoint as well. You know, there's like different images and ads for everything. And oh, I'm going to. And- I can't wait. <laughs> That's almost worth flying to Adelaide for on its own. <laughs> um, let's see. What should we look at here? So in the last episode, we talked about favorite places this was a podcast idea from tim what were your favorite places when you were a kid and a teenager and an adult and tim and i shared our favorite places happy places happy places sort of sorry like, yes happy yeah. yes my mm. mistake it was happy places and we've had lots of people get in touch if if you go to our subreddit for the last episode episode 141 you can read some of them i'm not going to read them all out now but i have read everyone's contributions and i really enjoyed them some people went into lots of detail and it was it was really fun thank you for sharing so mm. do go and have a look at that subreddit for episode 141 but there's a couple i wanted to read out this one really appealed to me, so it just appealed to me personally, so I wanted to read it. Hmm. 
It comes from Peter in LA. This was an email. My happy place as a child was a room in my house called Tic Tac Room. The room was filled with Lego, and I would spend hours in there building and playing. I would build automated candy dispensers, design Lego board games, and organize all my spare bricks. I'm still a big Lego fan today, and I personally love Lego plants, which is a little reference to me saying I didn't like Lego plant models. Um, Mm. The Tic Tac Room was also home to our European model train set. My dad had a modest collection of Marklin trains and tracks that he bought over from Belgium when he moved to the States, and we would spend time together around the holidays building a track or gluing a little model house. If you're curious, the name Tic Tac is the name of the Belgian children's television show that I would watch as a toddler in that room. It's a bit of an odd show consisting of random music, animations and colours, although maybe your son will enjoy it. Anyways, the Unmade Podcast has brought me lots of joy over the past few years. Thank you for putting so much energy and care into all you do. And that was from Peter in LA. And that room sounds like my dream, full of Lego and a train set. I just bought my son his first train set this week. And I don't know what he thinks of it, but I'm... No, I do know what he thinks of it. He's loving it, and I'm like... He's loving it more than I thought he would, which has made me so happy, Mm. and I'm totally loving it. Designing the tracks and pushing the trains around. Oh, it's... This is... I've gone a bit early on the train set for his age, but it's because I wanted it so much. (laughs) Uh, Great fun. Some friends of mine, a couple of families I knew had a rumpus room, Mm. like a play area just for mucking around. Yeah. Oh, they were so awesome. I can still picture the feeling of being in in them now and how cool they were. Oh, the Tic Tac room. Sounds amazing, Peter. Uh, And I thought I'd read one other one. This comes from the Banjo Lady, who did contribute this to the to the Reddit, so you can read it there too. My childhood happy place was our neighbourhood. There was a whole gaggle of kids and we called ourselves the 10th Street Gang. The empty lot next to our house hosted daily afternoon baseball games or kickball when the little kids showed up. Every summer evening, we'd meet there for a game of kick the can, which involved hiding everywhere within a four block range. We'd play until way after dark until Stephen's mother would shout out from her backyard, Stephen! That gave us all about five minutes to show up at home or face the consequences. Then, one winter, the happy place became magical when a winter rain flooded the field and froze into a neighbourhood skating rink. My dad installed an outdoor floodlight and we all skated every evening for weeks. Uh, Tell you what, this gave me an idea for a podcast, Tim. Mm -hmm. Imagine if the banjo lady made a podcast about getting the 10th Street gang back together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Imagine that, a podcast where people just get their childhood gang of friends who they haven't seen since they were really little back together. That's Wouldn't you a love cool that? Idea. How much that would you love to do idea. that? Yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. that would be cool. Yeah. There's a guy that lived over the back fence from me called Shane, and I haven't seen him since we moved away in 1989. Yeah. I'd love to see him. Yeah. yeah. And I want to see Simon again. What are you up to, Simon? I still have dreams that Simon and I have rekindled our friendship as adults and we catch up and Mm. it's like, oh, it's good to see you. And we sort of become friends again. And then we don't see each other again for a few years. But I remember, oh, it's okay because I caught up with him a few years ago as an adult. And then I wake up and none of it's true. I haven't seen Simon since school. What are you up to, Simon? (laughs) I should do a podcast tracking him down. You track down Shane and Simon, the Shane and Simon podcast, where you track down Shane and I track down Simon. Nice. Good idea. Well, well, yes. What What if they're doing a podcast somewhere? They've somehow hooked up. Awesome. And they're talking about us right now. Oh, too cool. Anyway, this is not ideas for podcasts. This is parish notices. Let me tell you, I heard from Mike. Mike sent us an email with all sorts of things in it. He wanted to talk about my half-mast idea, flags at half-mast. And he sent us some photos, which I found interesting. This is what Mike wrote. I've seen businesses with their corporate flags at half-mast alongside the country flags, like national flags, Mm. see the attached pictures of a Subway flag and a McDonald's flag. And he's attached some pictures of these flagpoles where they're like a couple of flags side by side, like the US flag. And then the McDonald's flag, just a big red flag with an M on it, a yellow M. And they're both at half-mast. And Mike continues, it always looks inappropriate, but a bit darned if you do, darned if you don't. Though I think the best solution would be to just totally lower the corporate flag on those days and avoid it completely. Yes. And I have to say, it did look really weird seeing the McDonald's flag and the Subway flag at half-mast. Yes, yes. Like, you know, like if the president dies or something, you don't want to see the McDonald's flag at half-mast. 
No, no. It's a brand. That's right. It's not a flag. It- but he's right, though, because if they do fly their flag and, like, you know, the Queen dies and you don't have the McDonald's flag at half-mast, it's, like, at full staff, everyone's going to be like, disrespect, disrespectful. So mm. I think he's right. I think you have to just take the flag down altogether. Don't they only fly the Macca's flag when Ronald McDonald is actually in residence? <laughs> What are they going to do when he dies? <laughs> um, I don't know. But if, but, but if the Hamburglar dies, they won't lower it and then there'll be an outcry out the front. Yeah. <laughs> the ham- there. Um, so is, rubble, is, rubble, is, rubble. Is stealing of hamburgers a punishable by death? I'm not sure. But um, um, <laughs> here's another thing Mike included in his email. Look, thanks for all your content, Mike. Mike says... Thanks for your content, Mike. Because, of, of course, in the last episode, we played a Zimbabwean advertising jingle. And I said, if you want to send in mm. catchy advertising jingles, you know, in the in reminiscent of our sofa shop obsession, send them in. Mike sent one in. He wrote, here's a catchy jingle from a crummy discount grocery store chain in the US that I found myself singing over the years. The first time I heard it, I thought it was a new pop song. It came out in 2010 and was right in line with mainstream pop songs of the time. They've even made their own variations on it. So here is the advertising jingle for the Save A Lot discount grocery store chain, which Mike says is a crummy discount grocery store chain. Tim and I pass no judgment because neither of us have shopped there, as far as I know. I work hard for my money, so it means a lot. I gotta buy things and don't want to spend a lot. My dollar goes far and save a lot. It's kind of catchy, but it's got that sort of 15 or so years ago, yeah. very produced, you know, yeah. <laughs> dense kind of poppy thing. Yeah. Sort of a bit Bon Jovi-esque, I think, I, in a way. Yeah. It was. It didn't really sound like a jingle in a lot of ways, did it? But yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no. Like I was thinking, oh, that's quite clever how it all rhymes. Except when you look, they've actually rhymed the same thing three times in a row. I work hard for my money, so it means a lot. I've got to buy things and don't want to spend a lot. My dollar goes far, it save a lot. <laughs> you're, just, you're just rhyming a lot three times in a row. Yeah, but the emphasis is different, so you get away with it. Ah, it sounds like a clever... I'm yeah, sure there's yeah. some technical name for rhyming the same thing in that way, but using... Yeah, anyway. Where shopping meets a better deal yeah 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 still not it still hasn't got the like spectacular woefulness that the sofa shop has like like the the Zimbabwean one from last episode and this one, like are, are, are veering into being good, like songs. Whereas the <laughs> yeah. sofa shop, while has while it has merit and craft and skill, have gone into the writing and the singing of it. It does have this kind of. It could only be an advertising jingle. Yeah, I think I, I agree. There's also a sparseness to a jingle. Like this was quite dense. Right. But a jingle sort of has just a real sparseness to it that yeah. really, you know, is open and bright and grabs your attention. Yeah. The sofa shop ain't gonna cost what you think it will. Don't you do a thing until you see the sofa shop. Oh, we, we talked last episode, Tim, about people working out while listening to the podcast. Oh, yeah. You know, are you in the gym uh, while you listen to the Animated Podcast? Uh Cohen or Cone Kern from the Netherlands says, Hello, Brady and Tim. Recently, you seem surprised to learn that a part of the audience listens to the podcast while working out. You might be interested in an odd phenomenon that occurs to me while doing so. For me, listening to podcasts while working out is quite common, although not in the gym, but outdoors during bike rides. The nature of this type of exercise actually fits quite well with the more steady pace of a podcast instead of upbeat music. Ah, right. I almost never ride exactly the same route and also take my bike on holidays, so there's a lot of variety. Yet once I do revisit a place at a later date, I'm immediately struck with the memory of the exact part of the podcast I was listening to. (laughs) 
Even though my memory generally isn't that great, I can sometimes recall the fragment word for word, even years later. It's as though you two start talking to me out of nowhere about some random topic. It's a bizarre experience. And it works both ways. If I re-listen to old episodes at home, I can visualise where I rode at the original time of listening. This has become something of a way for me to revisit memories in the same way music can, but more specific. Either way, you have accompanied me during many great adventurous bike rides. So thank you. <laughs> Classic. I can relate to that. Yeah. I sometimes get that. If I, if I have a particular part of a podcast I was listening to and I'm driving somewhere, like sometimes I then associate the two. Mm. Also, sometimes if I'm uh, exercising somewhere, like running somewhere, and I have a really good idea, um, I will always associate that place with the idea I had. Mm. Yeah. I can't relate to that. Like the running or the good idea. <laughs> Separately all together. <laughs> it does happen, um, but I think there's more. I mean, I would listen, apart from, say, going to sleep or in, uh, driving in the car, I would listen to a podcast out on a walk. And a walk and a ride feels a little bit different. That's sort of like a journeying kind of exercise. I think what we were imagining mm. is people in the gym going hard in a Pilates class or yeah. in a sweat mm. class or something or, or pushing weights and it just doesn't seem like we'd get you amped up. But maybe we do. Maybe we're more inspiring than we realise. I also am not sure how safe it is to be wearing headphones while riding a bike. Oh, but, right, yes. No, you know. No. We're very, we're very safety conscious tonight, aren't we? Maybe there's going to be a bicycle safety awareness course for Cohen coming up sometime. <laughs> we talked about me going to Disneyland. Colin wrote on the Reddit, We went to Disneyland Paris for our honeymoon. We had a much better time than Brady seemed to. I hope it didn't come across that I didn't have a good time in Disneyland. I know I made a lot of jokes, but I, I did enjoy it. Uh, but anyway, Colin continues, There was one event that went down into family legend. While queuing to see Minnie Mouse... A small child was working his way through the queue, pushing his way past other people behind us. We could see his parents encouraging him, and it was clearly annoying those who were patiently waiting. He came up behind us, and I put my leg out to block his path. Except he was a lot closer than I thought, and I kicked him in the shin, hmm. enough to knock him over and sent him back screaming to his mum and dad. At that point, Minnie's handler called us forward and we had our photos taken and the child was nowhere to be seen. But the day Colin kicked a child at Disneyland is repeated every time we're in a queue, although usually without the accidental part. It's our 25th wedding anniversary next month and if this story is worth being shared on the podcast, could you please thank my wife, Jenny, for 25 years of marriage? So, Jenny... Thank you for 25 years of marriage. Yes, yes. Not thank, to us, but to Colin. Thank you, Jenny, for 25 years of marriage. Yes. Mm. Well done. We well really done. appreciate we it. Do. We You've do. You've been great. You have. You've been great. Mm. And Colin, stop kicking little kids. Yes, All indeed. Right? He no. was a little kid. It wasn't his fault. He didn't know better. The queues to see princesses and Mickey Mouse and stuff at Disneyland Paris were well over two hours long. Wow. What do you mean to see Mickey Mouse? Isn't he just like walking around in the street and stuff? Or no, that's what that's what my wife thought was gonna it was gonna be like. But that's not what happens. And if you want to get if you want to get like a a, a one on one session where you know you go up and have a cuddle and a talk and a nice formal picture with a Disney character, mm. that's like they're the biggest queues you'll see. That's big time. Wow. Have you ever been in a queue and kicked a child? Uh, I was actually at child kicking safety awareness training just last month. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, all jokes aside, Tim and I do not condone the kicking of children. No, no, and indeed. Colin, you should be ashamed of no, yourself. That's right, Colin. <laughs> Absolutely, Colin. That's right. <laughs> I can't believe you're still married. Um, I, yeah, that that, that was a just a woman. joke. You're a wonderful woman, Jenny. We do appreciate it. Jenny, you're great. Jenny. Jenny. <sighs> Jenny's like 25 years. Incredible. Colin and Jenny. 25 amazing years. We have winners. We have unmade podcast Patreon supporters, stakeholders, who have been selected for prizes. Tim, would you like to read out the winners this week? I would. I would. First off the bat is Jenny for 25 no. <laughs> years of <laughs> Colin. All right. What we got, Tim? Who's winning what? All right. The winners tonight. Winning a key ring, a special unmade podcast key ring, is... Peter from Kewdale in Western Australia. An Aussie. Well, well done, done, Peter. Congratulations. 
And we have someone winning an unmade spoon. The lucky person is Haley from Cumbria in England. A pom. An Aussie yeah. and a pom. Well nice. done, Haley. Congratulations. Nice part of the world. Nice part of the world, Cumbria. And we have four. Whereabouts in England is Cumbria? It's sort of up like sort of Lake District, sort of up up north, north over north, um, northwest, hmm. up above Liverpool and Manchester and that sort of thing. Up above that? Isn't that just Scotland above there? No, there's more stuff before you get to Scotland, oh. like Cumbria. Right. Yep. Nice. Yep. I always think of them being on the border, but that's... But, no, no. Uh, and then winning cards, unmade podcast cards or Spoon of the Week cards. We have DC in Hong Kong, Joshua in New South Wales, uh, Jewelry, I want to say, J-O-E-R-I, Jewelry in Berlin, and Ben B in Colorado. Wonderful. Lovely disbursement around the world. Yeah. couple of Australia... Have we, got, have we only got one? We're only Ameri- yeah, we only got one American this week. Mm. Uh, Germany, Hong Kong. Yeah. Well, there's only 300 million of them. There you go. Uh, congratulations and thank you for supporting us on Patreon. All thanks to all our Patreon supporters, you make this show possible. We we could not do the show without you. If you'd like to support us, please keep us in mind. Every little bit helps. Tim, do you have an idea for a podcast? Oh, it's kind of an idea. It's something on my mind that I can't resolve. And maybe I was thinking my podcast could be about something on your mind that you can't resolve. So mm-hmm. this is uh, the when when I I can't work out if my favourite initial is T or H. Like on Facebook and other places, sometimes you get advertised merch, and it says, "Oh, look, buy this cap here with your initial on it." And I go, oh, that'd be cool. Mm. And I should mm. get it with, and I can never decide whether, like, my logo would be a T or whether it would be an H. Yeah, so if you had, like, a Letterman jacket type thing, would it be yeah. a big T on it? That's or a bigger? right, yeah. So it can't be TH. Obviously, you'd go TH if you, if you could have two letters. Well, that's right, yes, yes. Or would you go TJH? TJH, which looks kind of cool as well. When I was in year eight, we were doing sort of like a... Um, architecture draftsman drawing kind of you know tech studies class and we had to use our initials to come up with like a logo brand kind of idea with you know pencil and ruler all that kind of stuff and i came up with a version of th that i was never quite happy with it's like it was the Mm. it was the t i'm using my hands here which no one listening can hear but it's the t and then and then the h is kind of laying sideways on top of it so the the, the crossbar for the T becomes sort of the yeah. right hand side of the H, and then that's above that. And I was never quite. No, the, 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 don't you mean the left hand side of the H lying on its side? Oh well, the right or left H's are the same up and down. Oh yeah, yes. depending on <laughs> where. Right. Yeah, depending on where it's toppled from. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that does sound a bit lame, man. Like, I'm not sure that's the way to go. I know, but do you know, for every now and then, that was in year eight, right? So that's like 1988. Mm. From time to time in the 35 years since, I've thought, what's another way I could have put my two initials to make it look cool? <laughs> <laughs> TJH lends itself well to a good logo because the J drops down below the line in a nice way. Like That's a nice – they are not three nice letters for an initials. I'll give you that. Mm. Coming back to your conundrum, though, about whether you should have a T or an H on your cap. Yeah. I'm going to resolve this for you. I think the answer is simple. It has to be the T. Why? Because if you walked in with a T on your cap, Mm. I would go, ah, T, you know, Tim, because you're called Tim. Yeah. But if you walked in with an H on your cap, I would say to you, why is there an H on your cap? What's the H for? And you'd say, Hi, and it's my surname. And I'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, it is too, yeah. Okay, uh, I get it. Okay. But the T, I would know straight away what you were doing. The H, like, I don't know, because I associate you with the word Tim. I don't associate you with the word Hein. So the H would, would throw me. Same with me, you know. If I had a cap with a B on it, you'd go, ah, oh, yeah. B for Brady. Brady. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if I walked in with a cap with an H, you'd be confused. I'd be like, why are you wearing my cap? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's true. The so tea I think is if more, you've got one letter, mm. it has to be the T. I'm not sure the T looks as good, though. It sort of works. I mean, the H has a nice balanced feel to it. You know, it's got the crossbar there mm. and it's got the two pillars and that, that sort of works yeah. well. 
the tea, I know yeah. the tea has got it there, but it feels like it's got a bit of emptiness around it. It's a bit sparse. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry. That's the letter you're stuck with. The TJH would work, like if I was getting something embossed on my luggage or something like that, you know, that, yeah. that would work. Yeah. Coming back to your podcast idea, mm. this is a decent idea, like, you know, solve my problem, resolve my conundrum. I think there are lots of things like it, and you can also have, like, you know, court of public opinion, here's my dilemma and what do you think I should do. It's, an, it's a good, solid idea. I like, you know. But it's also, I've, but I also enjoy to, I enjoy the initials talk. <laughs> well, that was that was, to be to be honest. I feel quite satisfied. I think you've made a logical point, and I actually, feel, I'm actually happier to have that resolved. <laughs> How about the rate my initials podcast, where you tell people your initials and uh, and, and people say what they think? Because we're quite similar, obviously. You're TJH. I'm BJH. You know how there's like a, a few people with. Um, Oh, you know, like Roger Federer and um, Tiger Woods, they get to that stage of, you know, where they're, they're, they get their logo and they, they, they don't just, they're not just sponsored by, you know, Nike or whatever, but they have their own version. Yeah. Like Air Jordan, obviously, is a classic one. But, you yeah. know, Roger Federer has that kind of R and RF. Yeah. Tiger Woods has his TW thing. And yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. So it's a bit like that. It's like, oh, what would mine be? I, I wouldn't have it with Nike, but yeah. it, it's like. Designing your own cool team. logo. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do you know the other time it would be useful is if I opened mm. up a real estate business? Because, you know, they always have yes. those sorts of very clever... TJ Hine. Because uh, there's a famous real estate company in Adelaide called LJ Hooker. So you'd be TJ Hine. TJ Hine, you're the best. You're the best. LJ Hooker, you're the best. Do you have any problems that I could resolve for you, man? What What have you got going on? I think for your, your podcast idea to work, they have to be like personal issues, like um, not just like questions you have wondering. No. Because like just before the, the podcast started recording, I suddenly was struck by an insane desire to know why joysticks are called joysticks. Oh, yeah. But that, I, feel like, I feel like now we're just delving into podcasts about, you know, yeah. etymology or unanswered questions. But, and, but, but, yeah. but, but before, I, hang on, but before you move off it, like I agree, that's just about trivia. Yeah. Do, did you work it out? What? Do you know why? Why? I haven't, no, I haven't looked it up yet. Sorry, I don't <laughs> well, know. I haven't got the answer. <laughs> we've got to find that out now, first of all, before we disregard. No, no, let's, let's frustrate people by not giving them the answer. <laughs> why are joysticks called joysticks? Um, oh, dear. I mean, you know, you could guess that they're a stick and in early video games they were said to bring joy to the player of the game i guess but presumably they're not called that in in a plane though that's which is they're based on the idea they, they just grab the joystick you know in top gun that's not a line mm. the biggest conundrum i'm facing at the moment and maybe maybe you know the civilians can help with this is what to do with my growing lego collection because i do want to start building lego but it takes a lot of time i'm very busy with work i haven't got time to do it to really make it viable, it would have to kind of be work. Could I build my Lego in a way that is work? Could I make videos, podcasts? There's so much Lego content out there already where people show themselves building Legos mm. and things like that. So what is the way I can integrate my desire to start building Lego into work somehow? Is there something people would like to see? Is there an idea that I haven't thought of? I've thought of all the obvious things, but I don't think I could do the obvious ones in a unique way that would be offering something interesting to the world. The only thing about your Lego collection that I'm interested in seeing it in relation to work is you mm. making a video of how many unopened Lego boxes you have. I think that is... Yeah, but that's just like a one-off. That's just no, like that's one right. thing. Yeah. Oh, here's... I yeah. actually think you should... Counterintuitively, I don't think you should, it should be anything to do with work at all. I think it's something that you should... You very soon will have it as a dad thing with Edward and yeah. it should remain... Yeah. Uh, the, the, thing, the thing, the temptation or the thing that will be important for Edward is that your things with him are not commercialised or turned into work and... Yeah, do you know what I mean? I think this yep. should you could you yep. could even have a rule going Lego anything Lego is definitely not work. In fact, this is just a thing that he and I do that is always just mm. cool and it doesn't doesn't go anywhere else. You know what I mean? So that that would be a way to resolve it. Yeah, because he's not far off it, is he? Like how many? Like it's just a few years and then he can start on the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hope I'm going to have lots of those things with him anyway. No, like, indeed. Like yeah. sport. Mm -hmm. 
um, and like you know playing with the train sets and like you know I don't I don't uh, I don't feel like you know Lego is my only option there and I you know so I'm not but it is it's, it, that is an interesting piece of advice it's an interesting perspective you bring and it's I will throw that into the mix are you just itching to play with Lego yourself though is that the thing you actually just want to like, do it I don't think I don't think adult Lego enthusiasts like to call it playing with Lego I think they like <laughs> to call it building it or doing it I don't think I don't think they like to call it play just for the record but uh, although the word Lego does mean play I'm aware of that uh, but <laughs> but um, <laughs> But the the the, the Wim, Wimbledon champions are playing tennis. It's not derogatory to play that's something. True. You can- <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think that's using the word play in a different uh, context. I think adult adult Lego enthusiasts are taking themselves a little bit too seriously. Yeah. seriously. <laughs> no, there's a. I saw a video. There was a video with a famous NFL footballer mm-hmm. who's really into Lego, and a journalist asked him about his playing with Lego, and he corrected him and said, "I don't play with Lego. You know, I build Legos and I do Legos. I don't play." He didn't like it, and he's an NFL football player, mm. so he's a guy who plays sport for a living. Mm. So he he thinks it's different. Anyway, I think uh, it, I think it's a toy. I think Lego is a toy. I don't. Uh, not in this context. I think it's a toy. If I built the Millennium Falcon, mm. right, and then I got out the little figures and I pretended they were flying and having adventures and things like that, I would then be using it as a toy. Right. But if I just build it for the construction and then display it, I don't think it's a toy. I think it's a model. And I think a model is different to a toy. Hmm, a model is uh, different to a toy. I think it depends. I think Lego is a toy depending on how you use it. So I guess you go, you do go to like Toys R Us or Toy World and buy model aeroplanes and build them and glue them mm. and put them together. Do you think model aeroplanes are a toy? I think they, that's a good point. I, I guess so because mm. you buy them at a toy store. But you also would buy them at a model craft store. So they're yeah. a piece of You buy a can of Coke at a toy store. It doesn't mean it's a toy. <laughs> like toy stores are allowed to sell things that aren't toys. <laughs> I don't um, know. There's something about the fact that it's a ready-made product. It feels too easy to be craft. But so, so have you seen the modern Lego sets? <laughs> no, I know that. <laughs> but then they have. That's like going to IKEA and going, "Oh, it's a toy," because it's. Do you know what I mean? Like it's got instructions, mm. and you put this. Well, you're arguing that. against yourself now. Mm. But I think. But I. I think Lego is a toy or not a toy, depending on how you choose to engage with it. Yeah. Can it be? I guess it's. Mm. I guess it's a. It's a craft, isn't it? Like knitting and model aeroplanes and balsa wood and turning a bit of wood. I don't know. It's, it feels different because somehow I'll have to give it some thought. Well, it's different opinion. because a lot of people use it as a toy and it, it can be very toy-like, you know, Duplo Lego and, and little kids who build it and then pretend to fly the plane and crash them into it, you know. Mm. Of, course it, of course it can be a toy. But then you get these like very adult targeted sets that it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like play sitting and constructing you know a replica of the eiffel tower and then displaying it in your house doesn't feel like play it feels it's recreational it doesn't feel like play or toy though it feels uh feels different i don't know maybe i'm just being self-important because i'd like lego but uh, it's it's fun anyway coming back to the dilemma is that this is the dilemma is i want to dedicate time to it now really Mm. but i can't justify it because it would just cripple all my other projects so if it doesn't become a work project if it isn't somehow work then it's hard to justify the amount of time i want to dedicate to it uh you know it doesn't help that i'm the father of a two-year-old which also impinges on your time somewhat you could be like Brickman brady i'd love to hear some ideas what about a podcast tim you and i just building lego sets together while we while you talk? Is that while we talk? Is that interesting? I mean, I've obviously thought about that. I don't know. I feel like you need to see what's going on, but Yeah. And there'll be lots of oh I feel like Lego is sufficiently taxing on your brain that you probably couldn't do a podcast at the same time properly. It'd be too much like, oh can you pass me the red no, the red one with the two thing no, yeah, that no, it's behind yeah, oh, yep. Yeah. And like that's not very fun to listen to. There would be a lot of pauses mm. as well, of concentration, quietness. Mm. That doesn't lend yeah. itself well to podcasts. But I could be wrong. How to turn. That's a conundrum. How do I turn Lego into 
a podcast or a YouTube, in your case, a YouTube clip? How do you turn it into? Oh, there's, I mean, there's a million examples out there. Yeah. No, no. A new, new idea is what we mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, new or something that plays to my strengths. You know, some people make these fantastically produced stop motion videos, and you know, although I'm a video maker, I don't think I'm that good a video maker that I could be in their league and therefore why even do it because people should go and watch those other ones instead mm. so it's got to be something that plays to my my strengths your niche uh, mm. uh, before we finish tim uh we have an album release a ho- we're, we're releasing a whole album today well we're, we're not really releasing it we're just the we're the conduit people may remember uh we played that at song by was it the Jehovah's Witnesses? They had this song to help people remember the names of the twelve apostles. Mm. It was quite a catchy little song. It was. They were called apostles, and there were twelve of them. The the joke being Tim couldn't remember the name of the twelve apostles when I quizzed him twice, despite being a man of the cloth mm. Mm. who should know the Bible back to front, in mm. my opinion. <laughs> that's right. That's right. There was Peter. Didn't know the name of the Twelve Apostles. So we encouraged people to write other songs <laughs> to help memorise the names of the Twelve Apostles. We had a few contributions. We had one from a guy named Jay, and he, he sent us a catchy one. And then he sent us a second one, uh, like, a, like a new variation. And we jokingly said, we think you can do better, Jay. Make another one. Mm-hmm. And didn't think much more of it. Little did we know Jay went away and has made a whole album of... Uh, memorizing the apostle songs they're all they're all quite similar in structure but they're all a little bit different in genre and we're not going to play all these songs to you on the podcast because there is pretty there that's is pretty hardcore 12 yeah uh oh, there were 12 of them i didn't i didn't i missed the symmetry there mm. uh, that's quite clever yeah he should have named each one after an apostle i didn't mm. think of that uh yeah anyway th- there are 12 we're not going to play them all but i am going to put all 12 of them together and probably put it on the YouTube channel with some visualisation about what each one's about and stuff like that. Go and have a look. There'll be a link in the description. It'll be on the Unmade Podcast YouTube channel, all 12, back to back as the album. Um, But for people who don't want to do that and just want a little taste, Tim, the music expert of the Unmade Podcast, Mm -hmm. has listened to the whole Mm -hmm. album. And Tim, are there any that particularly caught your ear? Oh, look, there's some lovely work here, Brady. I love that uh, mm. essentially we've been sent to, uh, well, I've been sent to Know Your Apostles uh, awareness training. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jay's gone to a lot of trouble here to record a magnificent album. Um, with, with some, I think, it, firstly, it's been very professionally done, but there are a couple of favourites. Um, I have to I have to start with number two, Leave You As You Are, mm. which has got sort of a Nick Cave, you know, softer Nick Cave kind of mood to it. Should we hear a little bit of that one? I made a joke about an album that I would do Because I'm bored and I guess I'm going to follow through I, He did say it was inspired by Nick Cave, I believe. Yeah. Even a little bit Ben Folds 5, I think, as well. There's a little bit of that in there because it's quite soft, but that's that's good work. I did like number four as well, which is the um, Inspired by Tenacious D's Tribute, not the greatest song in the world. Let's hear a little bit of that one. Hey there, Tim, and hey there, Brady. I couldn't make the greatest song in the world. And then there's the first demo version, number 12, um, which is because it refers to, to, to Pastor Tim and Dr. Harron. Um, but that, that, that's a sort of a traditional sounding one. The one I think it's a version of the cleaned one of the, the initial one that he sent, which was, which was pretty good. Um, so you've heard that one before, but that, that sounded a bit cleaner um, and, and a little bit better. Judas James, Bartholomew. Thomas and sometimes Matthias too. I also like the slow dance version because there's like um, he's he's got the sort of prom night. For us, it was a um, the social every year, and there was like a slow dance kind of moment at the social where you could get you know a dance with someone, and uh, that brought back yeah. particular memories for me. Until the next time you ask the civilians for a sign. 
I like number six, the instrumental version, although it seems a bit pointless for helping memorise the uh, the names of the apostles, but yeah. he did an instrumental based on kind of the main music he uses. And I quite liked the pipe organ one, number seven. I realised these arrangements won't be done without a version using the pipe organ. Yeah, that was quite different from the others, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Very clever. We have a very big pipe organ. It's used on a song or two every week um, amongst more contemporary sort of stuff. And it's very impressive. Sort of blows your socks off. Yeah. Nice work. Really, right. really quality stuff, actually. Work holds together as an album really well, even though it's the same song over and over, uh, effectively. <laughs> but it's, um, All right. it's a lovely piece of work, Jay. We really, full respect. Well done. Lovely work. If I had to pick one, I'd go with number two. Number two, which is the, okay. it's called Leave You As You Are, which is a Nick Cave lyric. Well, we'll play, we'll play that one as we finish this episode. You can check out the full album in the notes, the description. And for those of you who are Patreon supporters, you can now nip over to the request room uh, and you can listen to even more content from Tim and I as we are asked various questions, including the burning question of who is taller out of Tim and Brady? <laughs> And Brady, it's Lunar New Year I'm now faced with a long weekend I made a joke about an album that I would do Because I'm bored and I guess I'm gonna follow through 